They also do uh, prison prevention in, in local schools in the counties and everything, getting the word of God in those kids' hands, and that's, what's going to, that's what it's going to take, amen. But what the Lord's called us to do, and, and me and my family, is we're going into the prisons here in the southeast of America. And my main focus, I'm helping out right now in South Carolina and North Carolina, but once we raise support and get, get support and be full-time ministry, uh, I'll coordinate prisons there in, in North Carolina, but still help out on revival teams throughout the Southeast. And, and the reason I, I, I want to stay in North Carolina is because I got a special place for my heart for the prisoners of North Carolina. And you say, why is that? And I'll tell you why is because if you look on the back of our prayer card, you'll see a young man who, who I just turned 20 years old in that picture. I turned 20 in September 2009. That's, that picture was taken December 2nd of 2009. And in that picture, you'll see a young man who was wrecking and ruining his life. And in that picture, I was facing over 30 years in the state penitentiary of North Carolina. I ended up taking a plea deal for five to seven years. And I did just over five years. Came home. And I was going to head right back to prison or I was going to head to a devil's hell. I came home and within the first four months of me being home from prison, two of my best friends got murdered. And then what happened was is that I was just biding my time and just trying to figure out what to do and uh, playing, playing games. And I met a young lady at the gym and that young lady started talking to her, got her number. My aunt was on her, her deathbed and... Uh, they were pulling the plug on her. They called the family in. What nothing else they can do for my aunt. And so our pastor, Pastor Josh Montgomery, came to the hospital to be there with the family and console the family. And he, I, that's the first time I met my pastor, Brother Josh. And uh, he invited me to church. So that young lady that I just met, just started talking to, I invited her to church. I said, would you like to go to church with me? And I knew something was missing in my life. I didn't know what. I was holding on to a profession that I made when I was a young kid, around 11, 12 years old. Got ran through a little prayer. And I was, I was holding on to that, thinking that I was okay because I was born in the South. I heard the name of Jesus. We, we celebrated his birthday on Christmas. And we celebrated his resurrection on Easter and went to church here and there on Easter and Christmas. And, and because I repeated that little prayer, I thought that I was okay. Well, that young lady that I invited to church, she, we sat on the, about the third row back on the left side. It's two, two rows like this. She, we sat on the back side of the, uh, the third rows from the left side. And uh, that young lady, for the first time, heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and that she must be born again. And she came forward and she knelt at the altar and she gave her heart to Christ and got saved that morning. And after she got saved, I seen the change that God did in her life. And God started working in my life and started convicting me. We, we, we would go to church here and there, and I just couldn't. I, the conviction was on me. In April of 2016, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired and understanding that I was lost and undone without God. And I was headed for a devil's hell if I didn't get saved. I knelt beside my bed in April of 2016, and I cried to a holy God to save me. And he changed my life, and he birthed me in the family of God. Amen. And then he called us to preach in March of 2017. I didn't know what the Lord would have us to do, what he'll call us to do. I mean, I had, I, I didn't really have no church in growing up, but I knew that he was calling me to preach his gospel and tell others about the saving grace of God. So I surrendered to the call to preach and, and was just trying to stay faithful to our local church and preach out when, when the time allotted us to do that and preach and fulfill our pulpit uh, when my pastor was away. And then in 2021, we was outside. There's a prison in Salisbury, Piedmont Correctional. We was preaching outside of the prison there because what Rock of Ages did was they got radio transmitters and they told the wardens and they told the chaplains that we will be outside of the prison at this time and we'll be on this station and that the men can tune in and they can hear the preaching of the word of God. So I had the opportunity that evening in April of 2021 to... Uh, preach under underneath the sycamore tree whatever kind of tree it was out there and I preached the gospel to those men and, and the Lord just burdened and broke my heart and he called me back into the prisons and he used 1 Timothy 2 4 where, where the Bible says who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of truth amen I believe that I believe that with every fiber of my being if I didn't believe that I wouldn't go into those prisons preaching to those inmates and to those convicts but I know that God loves them and God died for 
for them. And he sent his son and shed his blood for them. And he wants to see those men and those women saved. And he used that scripture and he told me, he's, he, he's like he told me, he said, son, I'm going to send you back in there. But you're not going in there this time as a prisoner. You're going this time as a preacher of my gospel. And I surrendered to that call. I said, Lord, you open up the doors. I will go. From 2021, we prayed for the Lord to open the doors and asked him to just to open the doors for us so we can do what he's called us to do. I can go to any prison here in South Carolina. In North Carolina, I have not been denied access into one prison that I have applied for. Matter of fact, I have preached in chapels and in, in services inside of a prison where I once was housed at. Telling those inmates about a Christ that loved them, that came, that lived a sinless life. And that if they, if they, if they come bases on the scripture and repentance and faith and put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll save their soul and he'll change their lives. Because those men and those women behind those cell doors, they're looking for something. And they're reaching out in all the wrong places. Many of them are converting to Islam. When I was in, in prison, a lot of African Americans were converting to Islam. And when I'm going back, I'm seeing more and more white people convert to Islam. A sad, it's, it's got the stronghold on them. And so the Lord has, has called us to go back into those prisons with that glorious gospel that saved my life and changed my life. Because I wouldn't be here without the saving grace of God. Amen. I don't deserve to be here. I deserve to be in hell. But God had mercy on me and had grace upon me. Amen. So we just asked as we, matter of fact, next month will be one year on deputation. We're right around 35%. And we're asking the Lord to, to bring in the supplies, I mean, the support that we need so we can, we can do what he's called us to do. Just to give you some perspective on North Carolina, North Carolina has 53 state penitentiaries that house around 30,000 inmates just in North Carolina alone. And I think South Carolina, I want to say y'all have 22 maybe uh, state penitentiaries that house around 18,000. 18,000 and 30,000, 53 state penitentiaries in North Carolina alone. The statistic shows that within three to five years of those men and those women's release, 50% of them will be back incarcerated, back under, under the, 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 the system, the, the criminal justice system. And I'll be the first to tell you that it does not work. It does not work. And what those men and those women need, they don't need the re reformation. They don't need to be taught how to think different. They don't need to be taught how to live different or how to act different. What those men and those women need is to be saved by the grace of God. And that's what he's called me to do. Go in there and preach Christ, him crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. And that's what I plan on doing. I've seen... We last service we was at, we had four inmates come up and, and, and confess that they was lost and they needed to be saved. And I got to take the scriptures and show them how they, they can be saved. They man bases on the Bible. And I want to ask that you pray for us. And uh, as we as we continue to do what the Lord's called us to do, and uh, we just want to be faithful to him. Amen. In these days, the times draw nigh where it was dark and no man can work. And I just want to stay to the plow. I want to stay focused and I want to stay doing what the Lord's called us to do. Amen. Amen. So if you got your Bibles, I got a portion of scripture on my heart. If you'll turn in, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. To give you a little encouragement, I just couldn't get away meditating coming down the road. We came, came in from Johnson City, Tennessee, had a meeting this morning. And uh, meditating on what the Lord will have us to preach. And I just had this thought on my mind. And I hope I'm a blessing to you, brother, and brothers and sisters, and encouragement. And uh, just want to be faithful. Acts chapter 16, we'll begin reading. We'll, just, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the first part, first four or five verses. But let's begin reading at verse 6 for sake of time. It says, Now when they had gone throughout Pergia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia... After they were come to Messiah, they essayed to go into Bethnia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Messiah, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, uh, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. 
And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel to, unto them. Let us ask the Lord for help. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your saving grace, Lord. We thank you for birthing us in the family of God, Lord, and putting us in the ministry, Lord, and counting us faithful, Lord. And we ask for the next little while, Lord, you empty me yourself, Lord, fill me with thy spirit, Lord. And I pray, Lord, as I preach the word of God, Lord, that something that's said, Lord, through these lips of clay, Lord, maybe stirs up the hearts of the believers, Lord God, sets them on fire, Lord, to do, Lord, see souls saved in these last days that we're living in, God. And we ask, Lord, that uh, anything that takes place here that you be honored and glorified for us in Jesus name. Amen and amen. As we find here in the book of Acts the 16th chapter we find the apostle Paul here on his second missionary journey. They're going back and they're checking on some church plants that Paul has established on his first missionary journey. And we find in the first couple uh, verses of this scripture, we find that the Paul comes across this young man, Timotheus, where it says in verse 1, a certain disciple there uh, named Timotheus. And we know that this man, Timotheus, also known as Timothy, Paul writes some epistles to this young man later on in his life. And we know that this man had a believing grandmother and a believing mother because Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and am persuaded that is in thee also. And then he says, 2 Timothy 3.15, and that from a child that has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I just want to say time out first and foremost and say thank God for godly grandmothers and some godly mothers, amen, that's going to pour, pour into their, their sons and their grandson's life the word of God, amen. Hey, let me tell you something. I give a thousand lives over to be born and raised in the church pews under the preaching of the word of God than what I had. And let me tell you, I had a good life growing up. My parents supplied enough for me, but I have, I'd rather have two nickels rubbing together, be raised on the church pew and hearing the preaching of the word of God than what I had. Amen. Cause ain't nothing like it. What's going to save this next generation is the preaching of the word of God. What's going to change this world in the course of its own in America in the course of this on is the preaching of the word of God. And what Eunice and, 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 and Lois did was they poured into Timothy the word of God, knowing that it would make him wise unto salvation. And one day, young Timothy, amen, came under conviction and got born again by the spirit of God. And many believe that he got saved under Paul's ministry on his first missionary journey because Paul says he calls him his own son in the faith, amen. And we had, we know that this man Timothy is a man of high character because in verse 2, it says of Timothy, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystria in Iconium. There's still some young man standing for truth today, amen. Just as Timothy was standing for truth and was well reported of by the brethren, amen. I believe that there's still young men that's well reported of that they could be put in positions in the church, amen, because that is the next generation that we're preaching to. And then the Apostle Paul, he would take this young man and, 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 and take him under his wing and they would go on and they would start on another missionary journey. Because in Acts 3, him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew that all that his father was a Greek. Now dealing with that verse 3, I believe that there's a bunch of argument with this, that Paul was wrong with getting Timothy circumcised, that he shouldn't have done it. And then the other side says that Paul was, he was fine for having Timothy circumcised. I stand with the latter. I believe that it was okay what Paul did here in the scriptures because they knew that Paul was a Greek and a Jew. He was half Greek, half Jew. And it says that they, that they knew that his father was a Greek. Amen. And so Paul taking Timothy with 
with him and going into these synagogues and going and preaching the gospel of Christ to these Jews and all these synagogues, having Timothy circumcised would not hinder the work that was to be done that Paul wanted to do. Amen. If he did not have Timothy circumcised, those Jews would have wanted nothing to hear of Paul or of Timothy. But with him being circumcised, he could go into any synagogue in this world and they would have no question. He could stand up and he proclaimed the truth of the word of God. And I'm reminded of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I be free from all men, yet I've made myself a servant unto all that I might gain the more. Then he says this, and unto the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jew. And I, I believe that's what he was doing here with Timothy. He's saying, look, Timothy, you're half Jew. We need to get you circumcised. It won't hinder this work. Amen. And then it, also, I want to put this out to you that in Galatia, in Galatia 2, 3, he says, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So he took Titus with him later on, and he didn't have t Titus circumcised, but he had Timothy. And Titus, being just a Greek, not having any Jewish heritage, didn't need to be and wasn't compelled to be. So that's why I believe that Paul was okay dealing how he dealt with Timothy in this text. But as we see that Paul's checking in on these churches, and he's wanting to expand his range. He's wanting to take the gospel into another range that has not been reached by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants to take it into Asia. This was a large province of Asia Minor. It had flourishing cities. But he was forbidding by the Holy Ghost to go there. And you say, why would, why would the Holy Spirit not want Paul, one of the greatest missionaries, one of the greatest preachers to walk in shoe leather outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, go into a region that has not been reached by the, by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would he forbid in them? Why would he not want that? Now, I'll be honest with you. I think the reason that he wanted Paul not to go into Asia Minor because he wasn't ready yet. And I also believe that we hold in our hands this King James Bible because instead of going into Asia, he went into Europe. Amen. And we'll get to it later on in the text. But I want to say this, that Asia did get the gospel later on. In Acts 19, it says, And this continued by the space of two years, so they all that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord. Amen. They got the word of God. Amen. In their time. Amen. And many Christians have been born again in that province called Asia. Amen. And also he was forbidden to go in Bethania. And this place would also get the gospel because Paul, Peter, writing in his epistle, says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethania. Amen. Those two places that Paul was forbidden enough to go with the gospel later on got the word of God. Amen. Thank God he, he's not slack concerning his promise that some men count slackness. Amen. But all should come to repentance. Amen. And he sent the word of God over into those quarters, amen. And we find that when he's coming to Troas, Paul receives this vision. But I want to say this, that Paul's third choice to depart was Troas, and he was led by the Holy Spirit there. Sometimes we have to lay aside our will for the will of God. Sometimes our personal will does not line up with the will of God, amen. And I'll be the first to tell you, it took the will of God and the calling of God on my life to send me back into prisons. That was the last thing on my mind, to go back behind those cell doors. Amen. I didn't want to never go back in there, did have no desire to go back. But when I was preaching under that tree and God started burning my heart and showing me, son, that used to be you. And what would you have done if you heard the preaching of the word of God? And they need the preaching of the word of God. And I said, God, I'll go. God, I'll go. I laid down the will of my life, amen, and what, what I wanted to do. And I said, Lord, I'll surrender to your will, amen. One writer said this, that God sometimes guides as much as by closing doors as much as he does by opening them. Not every closed door in your life is a hindrance to the God's will in your life. Amen. Sometimes God's closing doors in your life and he's leading just as much through those closed doors as he is through opening doors. Amen. I'm going to tell you, it took for two, from 2021, we didn't get accept, accepted with Rock of Ages till 2023. And at the beginning of 2023 is when I found out that I could 
to the prisons. I had to wait for two years praying, God, please open the door. God, I know you called me. He gave me scriptures. He gave me verses to solidify his will in my life. And I'm praying, seeking, God, please open the door. And you know, I almost tried to jump in front of the will of God and try to say, I know he's given me the scriptures. Amen. I know that this is what he's called me to do. So I'm going to do it. And my pastor and his wisdom, amen, said, just be patient, son. Just be patient. He's going, to, he's going to open the doors, amen. And he has flooded the doors wide open, amen. Next a couple of weeks, I'll be at Roanoke River in the prison in the three-day revival, amen. And that's all the way on the coast of North Carolina. So pray for us as we go down there and try to preach the word of God to those men. But if I tried to get ahead of the, uh, of the will of God, that could have been a hindrance to him, amen. But God guides as much as closing doors as much as he does by opening them. Amen. So here, and, and, and that was all introduction, and I won't be long here, we find in verse, in verse 10, and after he has seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. And this verse right here, verse 10, the latter portion of it, what I'm about to read, this is the verses when God was dealing in my heart and my life to preach his word. This is the verse he gave me to solidify that calling on my life. Assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Thank God for the calling of, of, of God in our lives. Amen. But I want you to notice about this Macedonia vision. I want you to notice first of all the cry. Look at verse 9. It says, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come, into, come over into Macedonia. It's, and help us, amen, excuse me. I noticed this cry. I noticed, first of all, about this cry, it is a cry for help, amen. It is vision that Paul had. This man was crying out to the apostle Paul saying, come over here and help us, amen. You have what we need, amen. You have the message that we need. You have the gospel that we need. And that's how I see those inmates behind those prison walls. Yeah, they might be hardened and they might not want nothing to do, but deep down in their heart and their soul, they're crying out for help, amen. There's something missing in those prisoners' lives and they might not know what it is, but I know what it is and it's the Lord Jesus Christ and their heart and their soul might be crying out for help, amen. Man, those people that you're translating the Bible for, brother, their hearts and their lives are crying out for help. And that's the only help that, that we have to give them, amen. And they don't need no money. They don't need no programs, amen. They just need the gospel, amen. And that is the greatest cry and the greatest help that anyone can give somebody in this world is telling them about the grace of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, if those, those homeless people, I don't know if y'all got a bunch of homeless people down here in Greer, but they're flooded in Salisbury that yeah I could give them a burger and that might fill their belly for a little bit I might give them some money and they might go spend it to do something with amen and that, that'll help them for a little bit amen but the help that they really need is everlasting help it's eternal help amen and it is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ it's a cry for help amen but also it's a cry for hope Ephesians 2.12 tells us that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. This man in this Macedonia vision, he's crying out for help. Come and help us. And he's crying out for the hope that the Apostle Paul had in his heart and in his life. And that hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only thing worth living for. That's the only thing worth keep going for. Amen. To stand up here and keep preaching. Telling another person is because of the hope that we're looking forward to in eternity. Amen. Romans 8, 24 says, For we are saved by hope, but what? But hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth, why doth he hath hope for? This man knew that the only hope for his people was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's a cry for help. It's a cry for hope. But it is a cry to heed. It is a cry to heed to. That word heed means to mind, to regard, with care, to take notice of, to attend to, to observe, to have seriousness. This cry that this man was crying out to the Apostle Paul was one that the Apostle Paul took seriously and that he heeded to. And it says immediately they endeavored to go. 
into Macedonia. Paul didn't wait. When he seen this vision, immediately he heeded to the call and he went. And that's how we should be as Christians. There's a great cry out there in this lost and dying world. There's a great cry from our lost loved ones. Are we heeded to that cry that they're crying out? They might want nothing to do with it. They might call you a Bible thumper or whatever, uh, uh, whatever they want to call you. But deep in their heart, they're crying out. And it's a cry that every Christian needs to heed. Not just preachers, not just evangelists or missionaries. Every born again child needs to heed to the cry to the lost and dying world. Amen. So I notice about this cry, it's a cry to help. It's a cry to heed. It's a cry for hope. But I notice secondly about the, the Macedonia vision, there is a calling. It says, assuredly gathering that the Lord called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Thank God for the calling on my life. Amen. I desire nothing more in, in my life than preach the word of God. Right now, we're at, a, we're at a point in our ministry and on deputation right now. We're praying that next month, that will be my last month working the public workforce. Lord willing, we're praying that next month I'll turn my notice in and tell my job I'm done. Because I have a calling on my life. It's a divine call. The Lord called them. Now, yes, the man called, cried for help, but it said assuredly gathering that the Lord called them into Matt for us to preach the gospel. Amen. Mama didn't call them. Daddy or grandma didn't call them. The Lord called the apostle Paul to go into Macedonia. Amen. And I thank God for the calling. Amen. And I believe that God is still calling young men into the ministry, still calling young women to, to surrender their lives, to, to be preachers wives and to be missionaries wives or evangelist wives. Amen. I believe that the Lord is still calling. He's still calling in salvation. All come unto me, amen, and have rest, amen, and find eternal life. He's still calling for salvation. He's still calling men into the ministry, amen. And not only is it a divine call, but it is a direct call. God's call will always be direct in our lives. We flew out before we, before we surrendered with Rock of Ages. We flew out to Utah with Brother Nathan Kirkman. I don't know if y'all support him. He's doing a great work out there in 2020. We flew out there to, to be a part of his vision week. Because I said, we didn't know what the Lord have us to do. So we flew out there and was a part of his vision week. And there's a great burden out there. There's a great need out there. There's a great call out there. I mean, there's a great cry out there. But the thing is, is that I did not have a call to go out there. And I believe that as, as, as we can get messed up in this life, if, if we... We see the need, we see the burden, we see the, 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 the great things that could be done. Because I guarantee you that if Paul, the Apostle Paul went into Asia, souls would have been saved, churches would have been planted, and, and lives would have been changed. I, I have no doubt about that. But you want to know something else? He would have been out of the will of God. Because it says he was forbidden to go there. And I've been reading behind some, some men, and, and I don't know, I have to study it out more. Some people believe that after his one missionary journey, when he went back to Jerusalem, that he was out of the will of God then. He should have went straight to Rome. But when he went to Rome, he got to Rome years later, but he went to Rome as a prisoner. And they were saying that if he didn't go to Jerusalem and got arrested... That, and he went straight to Rome that more things would have been done. I don't know where I stand. No, I probably have to study it out more. But, but I'm telling you what, I've seen a lot of men get out of the will of God because, because they, 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 they thought they had a calling, but it was just a need and a burden. There's a difference between a burden and a calling. It would have been easy to go out to Utah. Great need. Could have planted a church and could have seen many great things done. But I would have been out of the will of God because I had no calling on my life to go out there. I have a calling on my life to go behind those prison walls and tell those inmates about the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I had there's a burden and I'll go out there and help and I'll knock on doors if the Lord lets us on deputation. But I have no call and amen. But he still his call will always be direct. There's no gray area in God in his calling. Amen. It's going to be direct and he's going to line it up with scriptures and he's going to give you what you need to do. And not only is it a direct call, divine call, but it is a desired call. 
First Timothy 3, 1 says, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Paul's ministry was all about helping people through the preaching of the gospel, that he desired the calling on this life. The reason Paul kept doing what he's doing, and he can say at his last days in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the face, is because he desired the calling on his life. He desired that calling. This just wasn't just a means of payment for the Apostle Paul. I mean, if anybody had the reason to quit and just be done with it was the Apostle Paul. He was beaten, shipwrecked, put in prison. We see here later in the text he's going to be put in prison again. But, but if anybody had a reason to quit would be the Apostle Paul. And many people quit nowadays in the ministry because, because the most minute things, amen. But Apostle Paul beaten, shipwrecked, arrested for preaching the gospel, arrested for his faith, and he did not quit. You know why? Because he desired that calling on his life, amen. He desired it, and he wanted to be faithful in what the Lord called him to do. So we see the cry, we see the call, but then we notice this later on in this text. We notice the converts. We notice in verse 14, a certain woman, this woman was named Lydia. This is the first convert on the, on the continent of Europe. The first convert that the Apostle Paul had on the continent of Europe was this woman named Lydia who's a seller of purple. That means she dealt in valued luxurious product. And then secondly, we see the certain jailer. We know that Paul is arrested after they, they run across that, that demon-possessed woman and, and they, they cast that demon out of her. And I would have loved to put that, that, that woman in, in the, the message and say that she was a convert, but I don't know. It doesn't say that she believed. It just says Paul cast the demon out of her and then they were put in jail because the rulers of her, they were messing with their money and they were put in jail. But... I would have loved to put it in there, but, but we don't know if she's saved. We'll know one day when we get to heaven, but we know that this certain jailer was saved. Paul and Silas arrested and put in jail, and then they're praying and singing praises, and, the, and, and, and then that, 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 uh, that jail doors rocked, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper, that jailer of the prison, awakened out of his sleep and seeing his prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with, with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Amen. This certain jailer was under thought he was under condemnation he seen that those prisoners were released and gone and they fled he was going to get killed himself so he was going to do it easy way take himself out but Paul cried out do thyself no harm and he said what must I do to be saved and they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved amen and he got born again converts in the scriptures amen and not only the converts we notice the church because Paul had a Macedonia vision. We see a Lydia getting saved. We see this jailer getting saved. And we know many more people got born again by the preaching of the word of God. Because we got a little book in, in the scriptures called the book of Philippians. One of the precious book in our scriptures. Love the book of Philippians. Also known as the book of joy. We notice the church in Philippi. Paul, writing back to this church, he says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And then in Philippians 4, 15 and 16, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again into my necessity. This church in Philippi, Paul writing back to him, he says, when I think about you, when I'm making my request to God and praying for you, I do it with joy. I do it with gladness in my heart. Because when I left here and I got sent on down my way on my journey, only you 
Out of all the churches in Macedonia, only this little church at Philippi sent to my necessity once and again. So we see that this church in Philippi, it was a gracious church. It was a giving church. It was a godly church. And it was a gospel church. Because Paul, in Acts 16, had a vision of the Macedonia, the Macedonia vision. He sees a man crying out for help. He goes over there. He sees converts. He sees people saved. He sees a church planted and established. And that little church helps him get on down his way on his missionary journey. We got a whole epistle to the church at Philippi, a whole book about joy. No matter what circumstances you're in, no matter what you're going through in life, you can have joy. Paul, writing back to that church at Philippi, is in prison himself. And he's thinking about that little church, thinking about what they've done for him on his journey and how they help him get down on his road. So Paul surrendered to the Macedonia vision. We see people saved, people helped, and now they have a blessed hope. And we have a whole epistle in our scriptures to the church of Philippians. And what a great epistle. So my question to you tonight is, what is your Macedonia vision? And if you want to take it a further step, because and I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that we hold in our hands the King James Bible because Paul went into Macedonia and didn't go into Asia. He went in that continent of Europe. You study out the English language. Now, I believe that wholeheartedly. I believe in the sovereignty of God, and I'm not a Calvinist. God's hand is all through the work of man's, amen. But we have the scriptures. We have a book. We see people help. We see people saved because Paul had a Macedonia vision. Imagine what God would do with your Macedonia vision. If you're surrendered to the call, heeded to the cry, doing what the Lord called you to do. He's still calling people. And you don't have to be a preacher. You can just be a layman. But God will give you a vision. Are you going to act upon it and do the will of God in your life? Or are we just going to sit on church pews and wait for the Lord return? I hope you have a Macedonia vision. If not, ask the Lord to do things. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our Father, and Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy, God. We thank you for the vision that you've given us to reach those inmates, Lord, that are lost and dying without you.